I want you to ask him to open your eyes again. That you may behold great and wondrous things out of his word. I want you to pray and ask God that at the end of the living spring today, light and illumination will shine forth in your heart that the mystery of your place in the body will be unveiled. The mystery of your assignment Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Father, we want to thank you again this morning. We give you glory and praise. We give you honor and adoration. Thank you for another opportunity to gather together to receive from you the engrafted word that has the capacity to deliver. We ask, Lord, that you open our understanding. We pray, Father, for the ministry, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit this morning. And let our understanding be opened. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Uh, Quickly, who can remind us of uh, our topic last Sunday? Can remind us of the topic of the Living Spring last Sunday. You were in church last Sunday and you can remember the topic. And I say, okay, Brother Ladipo. The Road of Aaron. Okay. We considered the Road of Aaron. The Road of Aaron. Now, the Two things happened that made uh, Moses to ask for the rods, the rod of Aaron and the other leaders uh, to be brought into the tabernacle overnight. Who can remind us of the reasons why God asked for them to keep their rod in the tabernacle overnight. Can anybody remember the reason for that? Okay, bro, Enoch. There was struggle for the position of a priest. Okay. That was why, sir. Praise the Lord. Yes, there was a struggle for the position of the priest. The various, you know, the story of uh, Datan, I mean, the rebellion of Datan, Korah, and Abiram that we considered. They, every one of the, the 250, they took their censers, remember? And they put fire on it. And, of course, you know, that's uh, an exclusive right of the, the, the high priest or the priest. So they were showing that, look, we also want to have a piece of this office. Alright? So, uh, God had to, you know, make his uh, decision very, very clear for everybody to know who ought to operate in that office. Here's the second reason. Anybody? Praise the Lord. Yeah. God wanted to be objective uh, in the selection of a who will be the priest, so there won't be any argument about as, as, as spare who is a priest. Praise the Lord. So that there won't be any ambiguity or any... Uh, it's not something that uh, they will argue about. That this is the person I have chosen. This is the person that will be my high priest. Praise the Lord. Now... Last week we also saw uh, the miracle of Aaron's rod, of dry stick becoming a living branch. Alright? Now what is, the, 
what, what, what was the message God was trying to pass across to uh, the children of Israel? For allowing only the, the rod of Aaron to bud. Only the rod of Aaron to produce uh, fruit. What was the reason? Or what was the message? Can somebody remember we discussed it last Sunday? What was the message? Behind Aaron's rod, budding, blossoming, and producing fruit. What was the message? Nobody can remember. Blood of Jesus. Okay. I can see uh, Jenna want to bail us out. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe it is to tell every other person that that is the lineage that has been chosen by God. Okay. Yes. Any other? All right. There's sister there, Sister Martha. Sorry, this way. Sister Martha is there. Fruitfulness is the best evidence of divine call. Praise the Lord. Fruitfulness is the best evidence of divine call. Now, there's a scripture we, we, that confirmed that. Can somebody remember the scripture? Amen. Yes. Give the, uh, the mic to Brother Michael. Psalm 22, verse 30. Okay. And then, of course, we, the Bible said in the book of John 16, 15, 16, that you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you may do what? Go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit may abide. So everyone here as a child of God is an ordained child of God. Praise the Lord. And so, the best evidence of divine call is fruitfulness. So, God allowed the rod of Aaron to bud, to blossom, and to produce fruit, which is an evidence of divine call. Praise the Lord. Now, Aaron's rod, in bearing fruit, there were three different stages. Three different stages, the budding stage, the blossoming stage, and the fruitful stage. What does that represent? We discussed it last Sunday. Can somebody remember? What does the budding, the blossoming, and the fruitful stage represent? Okay, give it to Bro Ladipo. Praise the Lord. The fruitfulness stage, the blossoming stage, I mean, the fruitfulness stage okay. is showing that there is continuity. Continuity. That means it's not just going to, the covenant is just not going to end at that point, but it's going to continue from generations to generations. Amen. The fruit represents something that is available now. The bud and the blossoming represent the future. So, it means that the priest's office is not just once and for, and for all things. It's a succession. It's, you know, it will continue from generation to generation. That is why Aaron's rod, it did not only bud, but blossomed and then produced fruit. Different stages. As the fruit is being consumed in cuts, the blossom will produce. You know, normally, when you look at a, a tree... When the tree buds, after the budding stage, it will blossom, it will open. And after opening, there will be pollination, remember? And then, I think it will produce the, 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 the fruits. Praise the Lord. So, it shows that the priest's office is from generation to generation. It will not only terminate with Aaron, but his children and children's children, so that in future generations, no one will come up again and want to strive, you know, for that office. God has, 
you know, given that office to become the office for Aaron and his future generation. Praise the Lord. Now, there are three items we also saw that were, after that experience, when the, 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 the road budded, blossomed and produced fruit, God asked Moses to keep it in the tab- tabernacle. To keep the, the, the road in the tabernacle. And then there are, we say there are other two other items that were also kept in the tabernacle. Can somebody remember? Can somebody remember the three items that were kept in the tabernacle? Sister Ngozi? The manna, a pot of manna. The and pot of manna. The um, tablet of commandment. Okay, and then uh, Aaron's rod. Now, what was the signi- significance of keeping those items in the ark? Particularly the rod of Aaron that budded. What was the significance of keeping, it, keeping them in the ark? Or in the tabernacle? Yes? Can somebody remind us? Okay, there's a brother there. Okay, Brosan, go ahead. Praise the Lord. Um, the, the rod was kept there for a memorial and also as a sign of authority and leadership. Okay. How about the other elements? The pot of manna and uh, the tablets. Okay. Give uh, the brother there. Amen. Amen. Those one for remembrance. For remembrance. We are talking about the significance of those items. Yes, sir. We say that the significance is number one, to show the coming generations how the church in the wilderness was fed, taught, and ruled. Ruled. Amen. We show, I mean, we say that the significance of the three items in the tabernacle was to show to generations to come how the ancient church, the church in the wilderness was fed, that represents the manna, was taught, that represents the tablets, and was ruled, that represents Aaron's rod. It shows how precious doctrine, sacrament, and government of the church are to God. Alright? The three elements, the f- Manna represents sacraments. And of course, we saw in the New Testament, God also instituted the sacrament. Very, very important. Last, the last Sunday of the, I mean, the first Sunday of every month, we uh, do the communion here, which represents the sacrament. And then, doctrine. Doctrine is also very, very important to God. Very, very important. It shows how precious, you know, those things are to Him. And then, of course, the government of the church equally important to God. So he said, keep these three things in the tabernacle as a memorial so that generations to come will see and they will know that these things are very, very dear to me. Praise the Lord. Today, we have a problem in Christianity. Somebody described the church in Africa, particularly in Nigeria, that the church is about a mile wide and an inch deep. We are very shallow in doctrine. Somebody goes out now, Christian that has been born again for a long time, probably you decide to preach to a Muslim, and then he confronts you. You people serve three gods. Somebody will find it difficult to defend the doctrine of Trinity. Because we don't take time to really establish ourselves in doctrine. We started considering that at the Bible study the doctrine of the Passover. Very, very important. So doctrine is very, very precious, very, very important to God. Amen. It's good to pray and uh, possess your possession for breakthrough and other things, but it's also good to know why you are a Christian, your Christian heritage. Very, very important. And then, of course, the government of the church. One of the things that God will not take lightly is to go against the authority or the government of the church. Hallelujah. The government, he respects it. Because when the government is in order, everything will go, you know, everything will be in order. 
Hallelujah. Orderliness. And God respects that. Now the last thing that we couldn't uh, conclude that day is uh, the response of the people. We didn't have the time to really do that very well. So we want to look at it today. Numbers 17 verses 12 to 13. Yeah, Julius, just before then, would you like to uh, help us? These three items that were preserved, where are they today? Okay. The senior pastor is asking the question, I'm sure it's not to me, to all of us. The three items that were preserved, where are they today? Who is going to help us? Amen. Where are they today? Uh, answer. If you want to answer, please, can we see your hand? Okay. Where are they today? Praise the Lord. I want to believe that those three items, um, if we go back to our history of the human race, when the flood came and then the planet was completely consumed by the flood, uh, my own little knowledge in this area is that those items were they were part of what was sorry on the items were after the flood yes they were after the oh, flood after, excuse me uh, after, after the, the flood, flood. I'm, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry now the the the, 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 the archaeologists will tell you according to what was done in terms of Christian history that if you went to Israel you can find certain things. But my need to knowledge in terms of this area is that most of all these things were in the disputed area surrounding where you have the Palestinians, you have the Christians, you have all these religions uh, vying for control right now in Israel where they are supposedly buried. Okay. So that's, that's my... That's now my, don't forget, that's my we are talking about knowledge in this area. the port of manna, we are talking about the tablet, the Ten Commandments, and the road, road of Aaron that boarded. So let's... Yes, bro, Dari. I want to believe that these things are with us today. The tablet, we have the word of God okay. with us. So these things, they are not like what we keep somewhere and we go to see now. We still have the, God, the church management authority, which the street wall command that we obey. So I believe they are still with us. Okay. All right. The things they are still with us today. Okay, somebody has a different... Okay, Brother Greg. And then I'll come to you, Sister Teresa. Brother Ray said, these things are still with us today. Praise God. My take is that as God kept the Garden of Eden completely still on this planet Earth, away from every human being going there, so also he has kept those three specific items. They're there, but we can't teach it. Okay. There, where, sir? You were asked me where is the Garden of Eden. I can't tell you because God has made it possible we don't know it. All right, Sister Teresa. Okay, I can see so many hands. All right, let's hear you and then I will... Praise the Lord. We'll be there on Friday, yes. Praise the Lord. Like um, Brother Larry said, the word is with us. Like the manna is the communion for me that we take now for okay. preservation. The rod is the, uh, is the word of God. The rod? No, sorry. The, the, the commandment. Tablet, yeah. The tablet is the word of God. Okay. Then the rod, there are priests and pastors and uh, leaders that God has put in charge of that office to guide and take right. authority. Yeah. Okay. Let's hear Bro Friday. I'll come to Mumiala and day. Bro Friday first. All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, I want to approach it in this way, sir. In those days, in the days of Aaron, and maybe probably till after a long time, those things were there physically for people to see. Like the scripture says, they were kept so that in the days to come, the children of Israel will ask, what is inside this ark? It says the Aaron's rod, the Ten Commandments, and then the manna. 
they can see, identify with it physically. Today, they are not physically there. You go to Israel today, you will not find those things in Jerusalem. They must be have been carried. But we are talking about maybe the uh, spiritual significance. Physically, those items are, they have been lost. They are not there. All right. Thank you, sir. Those items are lost physically. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In as much as I agree with what uh, Brother Friday said, based on what God said, that they should keep this in remembrance. Although the original materials may not be available, but they are still there in the tabernacle in the Holy Land. The replica are still there. Do we still have the tabernacle, the temple, the tabernacle? The The Moses uh, tabernacle. Is it still there in the Yes. Ah, okay. Is there? Praise the Lord. Maybe the the two times I went to Israel, they didn't take me to where the tabernacle is. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, the, the last account that was given in the Bible um, concerning the Holy of Holies yes, was when Christ died on the cross. Okay. And the Bible recalls that the veil leading to the Holy of Holies was torn in two. And that Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant was deposited. Okay. Now, I want to believe that when Christ died the embodiment or the representation of all the items in the ark were now translated through the death of Jesus Christ, through his word. So everything that were represented in the ark, we receive through his word. Amen. The word of God is profitable for instruction, reproof, and correction. That is government. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. That is guidance. And every other thing that we require is embedded in the word of God. All right. Okay, I would, somebody, you want to say something again? Contrary to what our brother has said? Okay, so let's, uh, I think uh, um, Kennedy has uh, said it all. When the, remember before now, in the Old Testament, not everybody, not even the Levite and some of the, the priests, deputy uh, high, uh, high priests, you know, could access the Holy of Holies. It was only the high priest, and he enters that place once every year. In fact, before he goes in, they will tie some uh, rope around his waist, so that uh, he, uh, by maybe some reasons, God decided to kill him inside the Holy of Holies. You know, nobody will go in and carry the dead body, so they will just use the rope to pull him out and then appoint uh, the next uh, person in line. Hallelujah. So, the, the Holy of Holies is uh, a place that nobody is allowed to enter except the high priest. Hallelujah. But when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible said the veil that separated the other people from the Holy of Holies was torn into two. That signifies access. We now have access into the Holy of Holies. Praise the Lord. And then the, if you allow me to use the word, the mystical uh, aura, whatever, surrounding that uh, Holy of Holies. It signifies that there is that succession in authority or priesthood. So if not... That we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't have men of God around us. That's my own thinking. Because they study the word, they teach, and others still come out of them as priests. Okay. That continue with that word. Okay. Yeah, Bro Victor. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe he's still bored. Okay. Please, I want to, with all due respect and permission, ask Senior Pastor to please stand, stand up and turn to his back. Amen. This is your fruit, sir. Amen. And more are still coming. It's continuous. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. I think that answers the question. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Of course, that is for that level of leadership. In your own place of leadership. Do you bud? Do your rod bud, blossom, and produce fruit? You know, only you can answer that. 
If you turn back like the senior pastor turned, can you see your fruit? Praise the Lord. If you are not seeing your fruit, that means something is wrong with your leadership, with your priesthood. Amen. And it shouldn't be so. God will help us in Jesus' name. All right. Let's read. The, we have just 10 minutes more. Um, number 17. Number 17. Okay, verses 12 and 13. Now remember, the reason why God asked Moses, we established that, the reason why God asked him to collect the roads from Aaron and the other leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, is to bring to an end the murmuring, the grumbling in the camp concerning the priestly office. Hallelujah. I remember last week we said the other murmurings and grumblings were God solved those uh, murmurings with instant judgment. But when it came to the case of Aaron, the priesthood, God decided to do it differently. Praise the Lord. Korah, his own case was a miracle of punishing sin. While Aaron's road was a miracle of preventing sin. Remember we established that. He said, this is how it's going to be. Any person's road that buds, blossom, and produce fruit will be the man I have chosen. So instead of punishing them, or causing the earth to open he tried to prevent them from murmuring again. But did that stop the children of Israel from doing that? Let's look at verse 12 and 13. Can somebody read 12 and 13 for us? And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? Praise the Lord. Uh, let me read from a different translation. Probably it will give us a... He said, And the Israelites cried out to Moses, we are, done, we are done for and doomed if we even go near the sacred tent. Um, praise the Lord. If you have a message, please can you read it for us because of time. Okay, he said, the people of Israel say to Moses, we are as good as death. This is our death sentence. Anyone who even get close to the dwelling of God is as good as dead. Are we all doomed? Praise the Lord. It's like, these people, the, from the answer, okay, let me just leave it to, to, to us. From the answer, can you, see, can you say that they have learned their lesson? From this answer that they have given. After seeing the miracle of Aaron's rod, budding, blossoming and producing fruit, can we say that they have learned their answer? I mean, they have learned their, their, their lesson. Yeah? Can we say that they have learned their lesson? The King James Version said, the last statement said, shall we be consumed by dying? In other words, will you always be killing us? Now remember, God didn't punish them here with death. But he gave them a miracle that would prevent them from further complaining and murmuring. And after Moses, uh, Aaron's rod budded, you know, blossomed and produced fruit, to signify that God has chosen Aaron and his family as priests, they still came back 
to Moses. Say, and the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die. Behold, we perish. We all perish. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? It's like you specialize in killing people. Your own is die, 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 fall and die. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Can we say they have learned a lesson? Nobody wants to say anything. All right, bro, Greg. Praise the Lord. They didn't seem to have learned any lesson as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Praise the Lord. Now, if given another opportunity, do you think these people will still contend for that office of a high priest? Do you think they will still contend for that office? After seeing the miracle of Aaron's rod budding, blossoming, and do you think they will still contend for it? Nobody wants to say something. Some of you are just smiling. Okay, somebody said no. Why? Why do you say no? Because of their complaining. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe they still will be a rebellious nation because up to today the children of Israel are still rebellious because after they had seen what God had done by choosing um, choosing Aaron and his um, rod burden, they still pitted themselves by complaining instead of praising God and thanking him for having shown again who he had chosen in leadership or as a priest. Praise the Lord. Now, let me ask, are they here from this uh, conclusion, were they quarreling with divine judgment or repenting of their rebellion? Praise the Lord. That means they have not learned their lesson. That means, given another opportunity, these guys will still rebel. So what, what do you think uh, would have been the antidote for their memory? What do you think would have pacified or what would, that, would have settled this matter once and for all, you know, for these people? If you were in their dispensation, their generation, what... What solution would you have preferred? Somebody said death. <laughs> hey, but that's what they were complaining that look, you are always killing, killing, killing. He said, do something else. Bring another solution. So what solution would you, would you have given? Okay, Bro Kennedy. Sorry, sir, I don't have a solution, but I have something close to a question. Okay. I am. Um, I think that um, this statement made by the people was predicated on shortly what had happened because God had just destroyed the 250 people who were holding censors apart from the people uh, apart from Korah, Data and Abiram and then it also said that about 14,000 people died so I believe the, this was like a self conviction that based on what we have done now God has shown that Aaron is his servant and we were all bringing people from our different tribes. So they felt that this was like God was going to be angry with them again. And they were going to have a repercussion of their actions. But remember, it was God's suggestion that leaders of their tribe should be presented with their road. It wasn't the people that brought that suggestion. It was God. Amen. When there was contention for that office, God took the initiative of asking the leaders of each tribe to be presented with their roads. And then Aaron too, you know, to be presented with his road to represent, you know, the family of the Levites. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I believe, this is my opinion, that... These people, the generation of um, Moses and uh, Aaron, and in fact generations even after them, they, 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 they took God for granted. He has he's promised to 
bless them to be their God. He had covenant with their fathers. And probably because of that, they decided to take God for granted. Hallelujah. And it's still happening today in church. Because of the mercies of God, because of His goodness to us, a lot of us believers, we take God for granted. And, uh, okay, somebody want to say something. Please, uh, you have to throw more light on this point for me. All right. You couldn't ask last Sunday. Okay. You to a exigency of time. Comparing the action of God towards Korah, Datan, and Abiram. When they revolted against Moses, okay, and the leaders of the tribes of Israel, when they murmured against Aaron, you said last Sunday that it's not all the time that God punish or destroy people that sin against Him. Yeah. And I was wondering, that could it be that um, sin carries different weights? In other words, some are pardonable, whereas others are not. Is it is, is it possible? Okay. If I understand your question right, why is it that God sometimes punish some sins and then... Okay. Alright. Well, I, I believe that um, God is sovereign. Okay? And He has the reasons for doing things the way He does them. You can see that there are situations where Two people will do the same thing. God will punish one and the other one will go scot free. It happens. One will escape, the other one will be punished. Now, my take on that is that there are some people by virtue of their, what their fathers have done, they enjoy some grace and mercy. Look at what, what uh, Solomon did. If it were not for David, his work with God, ah, Solomon would have entered into trouble. Big trouble. But I believe because of the relationship that God had with his father, Solomon enjoyed that mercy from God. Praise the Lord. So, there are reasons why God sometimes uh, will punish some act of uh, disobedience, and then so, not that they will go scot free. Not that they will go scot free. Probably some of the punishment will be postponed. Of course, we have seen that in the life of uh, Solomon. The, his ju- the judgment for Solomon was postponed. It was his son, Reho, Reho, is it Rehoboam, that suffered the consequences. The Bible said the two, I mean, the, the nation of Israel was divided into two. Ten went this way, and only two, you know, remained with the house of David. Praise the Lord. He was punished in the long run. That sin was punished. Praise the Lord. I don't know whether I have satisfied you. Maybe I will ask the senior pastor to help us out as he round up the... No, uh, Julius, what I would need you to do is to read the last two verses in the Good News edition. Okay. Whether that will still support the position that this was remorse or they were just, um, uh, what did you say they did? They were still in rebellion. Rebellion, okay. Yeah. Let's, uh, re- let's read it from the Good News edition. Okay. Those, the good- those two verses and see whether that will support uh, the position you have taken. Praise the Lord. The Good News uh, version says, The people of Israel say to Moses, Then that's the end of us. If anyone who even comes near the tent must die, then we are all as good as dead. Praise the Lord. Now, what picture of God, if you read this statement, what picture of God do you have? What picture of God does this statement give you? That God is a killer. Praise the Lord. That this man is a killer. Because he said that the people of Israel said to Moses, then that is the end of us. Was that what God 
was saying concerning them at that time? No. If anyone who even comes near the tent must die, then we are all as good as dead. No. I think God gave that instruction to show that this is the person that he has appointed to be his high priest. But of course it's not a death sentence to the congregation. But they, uh, to me, this is a wrong uh, image of God they are portraying. That God is a killer. Is somebody that if you do any little thing, he's ready, he's like wielding a big stick. Looking for people that are doing the committing mistake to hit them on the head. To me, that's not the picture of God that I have. So I, I still feel, or that's my opinion, I still feel these people are not, they, 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 they were still living in the disobedience. Praise the Lord. Brother Pascal, you want to say something, sir? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My opinion concerning these last two verses has to do with the fact that the Lord, God is the God that demands absolute obedience. Okay. Absolute obedience. You will recall when Samuel was talking to um, Saul, Somewhere reference that most famous um, passage in the Bible saying that obedience is better than sacrifice. sacrifice yeah. The Lord can use any means necessary to get his message across to the children of Israel. Killing whatever he wants to do, he can do it. That's his own divine prerogative. But the issue here is that are we obedient to the word of God? Are we obedient children of the living God? If the children of Israel will obey God, there will be no reason to make any sacrifices, i.e. like dying or being punished, whatever it is. The Lord must be obeyed. That's the bottom line. Praise the Lord. To conclude, I want us to read Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Romans 3, 23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, let me read from another translation. It says, Since all have sinned, and are falling short of the honor and glory which God bestows and receives. You know, most of the time, when people sin, what they think of is the judgment. What they think about is the condemnation. What they think about is probably what God will do. But here, the Bible says, what God Things about when you sin is the glory you will lose. Is the glory you will miss. Hallelujah. So God is more concerned about what you will lose than the judgment you will receive. He said, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the honor and glory. So sin denies man the honor and glory that God has prepared for you. So that God is paying more by the glory you will lose than the punishment you bring upon you. So I, I, I believe those guys, they had a wrong image of God. It's just thinking God is a killer. God is every, every little thing you do, he wants you, he will kill you. He would, he's not. Praise the Lord. Because the original plan of God is for man to share his glory with him. Hallelujah. So God is always concerned of the glory you will lose when you go into disobedience than the punishment that will come upon you. Praise the Lord. I pray that God will help us to have better understanding of this God that is our Father, that loves us, so that we can walk closely with Him and enjoy the glory that He has packaged for our lives in Jesus' name. 
Shall we rise as we pray? Praise the Lord. This month has been declared to be the month of His glory. Amen. I want you to just close your eyes and ask God, O oh Lord, reveal your glory in my life this month. Let your glory be revealed. Let your glory be revealed. I wish the Israelis that have concentrated on the glory than the punishment. Because that will become a motivation. Punishment is a motivation. Glory is also a motivation. So the one you focus on will determine the direction your life will go to, towards. If you are always looking at the punishment, you will be so punishment conscious. When you are looking towards the glory, you will be so up, you know, consumed with the desire for the glory. And that will help you to live your life in a way that will make you qualify for the glory. So I want you to pray, Oh God, open my eyes. To see your glory this morning. Moses said, God, show me your glory. And because his, his focus was on the glory, the glory rested upon his life. That The Bible says his skin began to shine. Oh God, reveal your glory upon my life this month. Let that be your prayer this morning. In Jesus' name we are.